this moment right now is a Polyanian double movement. A moment when the faults in the old system become obvious and a new system begins. And though Corona is the endpoint of this transition period, its prime symptom is populism. But this isn't the first time this has happened. We have already had two other such moments. The periods these transitions bridge then are the liberal, Keynesian and neo-liberal periods, respectively. And the next one will probably be a neo-Keynesian one, if everything goes right. But this will require significant will to reform, and left parties still seem to be stuck in their narrative of wanting to unite the country, a strategy that is obviously bound to fail. But this would not be the first time this has happened. Left parties have a history of it. And in understanding these past transition periods, we might understand where we are heading right now. The liberal age has its origins back in the British philosophers of the Enlightenment. It all begins with John Locke, who basically wrote merchant propaganda, trying to disempower the king. In short, he said that property is God-given, and thus the state has no right to tax it. Subsequent philosophers built off this then, and delivered arguments for why the state wasn't allowed to issue debts, tax, or even do anything in the economy. Many of the ideas are still making the rounds today, and they are still just as dumb. Eventually, all of this philosophy helped create a liberal Nightwatch state that didn't do anything except police property. Naturally, this made inequality ginormous and impoverished millions. And it is into this uncertainty, combined with inequality, that Marxism was born. In 1863, the SPD was founded. Back then, still known as the ADAV, it was Vaterhaus und Lebensinhalt, home and meaning. There were party pubs, schools, and even morgues. And such a comprehensive party naturally makes for a powerful movement. And so the model spread. First to Sweden with the SAP, and then to Britain with the Labour Party. Over time, these parties slowly got into government. In the meantime, growing from radical Marxism into well-accepted, even middle-class parties. Much of this growth can be attributed to the incredible variety of socialist print. The SPD, for example, spent 50% of its revenues on newspapers. It is no surprise then that the entire party leadership in all countries was comprised of former journalists, including the finance ministers Hilferding, Thorsten and Snowden. It is for this reason that left parties back then can be understood as divorced from economics. The quote-unquote experts back then were simply Marxist journalists. And considering that economics back then really was nothing but tax dodging, this was a good thing. It is how left parties achieved some successes at redistribution, even though finance in this age was global. Speaking of finance, has anybody watched the stock market? The liberal age came to a sudden end when the unregulated, debt fueled market rally crashed in 1929. Stuck in a doom loop, what was necessary to get the economy going again was deficit spending by the state. But liberal economics prohibited this. According to them, you should even cut spending. But left parties weren't helpful either. And this marks the first, but not last time, that a lack of reform produced catastrophe. You see, Marx said that a communist utopia was inevitable, and crisis would simply lead workers to rebel. Therefore, Orthodox Marxists shouldn't be doing anything either. And it is this surprisingly dumb reason that led left parties to not do anything against the crisis either. Both Hilferding and Snowden refused to get the economy going again. And while in Britain, Labour only lost all its seats in Germany, this led to the rise of the Nazis. They were the only party that promised deficit spending. And worst of all, it worked. Sure, it wasn't sustainable, but when you are hungry and someone helps you, you become very, very loyal. There was one exception to this, however, and it shows you how productive vision from left parties can be. In 1925, the orthodox finance minister Thorsten surprisingly died. The guy who took his place was Ernst Wigfors, a young academic from Göteborg. He represented the new generation of academic leftists and not the old and persecuted OG socialist generation. And together with his friends from the Stockholm School of Economics, he swiftly implemented new radical ideas. 
and it worked. Unemployment was gone and the SAP had proven so successful that it would rule Sweden for decades, turning it into the lefty utopia we now think of. Now the American Democratic Party enters the stage as well. Coming from a country where historically parties did not have ideologies, new radical ideas had no problem penetrating into politics. The New Deal marks the beginning of Democrats being left in the proper sense of the word. Randomly enough, the only reason the New Deal wasn't implemented earlier was because Hoover thought it was communist. Skip the period of awkward family photos and we get to the Keynesian era. Government intervention in the economy had proven so successful that economics was turned on its head. The science suddenly turned left-wing and oh boy was it glorious. Left parties now fused with economics. The bottom 90% captured all the growth now. And inequality went down. Because the government suddenly had a say in the economy, advisory councils were installed, infesting even right-wing governments with lefties. This led to crazy events like Nixon demanding a UBI. The SPD's turn away from Marxism, however, came decisively too late. The right wing was able to demonize the SPD's extreme rhetoric in early elections, making Germany's post-war architecture remarkably liberal. Because of this, German wages never grew quite as much as in other countries, making it an export-driven economy. But it also, at first, saved the SPD from the second interregnum of this story. The golden age of capitalism worked just a bit too well. Towards the end of the 60s, wage demands grew just a bit too fast, leading companies to raise prices. In a spiral of further wage demands, inflation went through the roof. That, however, acted as a premium on investment, and so money went on strike. Eventually, this lack of investment created stagnation, and unemployment shot up. Welcome to stagflation. In the beginning, Keynesian economists prescribed more government spending to fix things. But this only further heated things up. Eventually, it became clear that wage growth had to be restricted, causing left parties to have falling outs with unions. Only Chancellor Schmidt managed to keep relations well, because Germany was mostly unharmed by inflation. Wages here never truly grew as much. LMAO, he was cooped in 1982 anyway as well as all other lefties when conservatives won the election. And they now implemented neoliberalism, an ideology that was basically just cooked up arguments from the 17th century. And so naturally, inequality once more shot up, wages stagnated, and the rich were once more the winners. And this leads us to leftism's fourth and arguably dumbest reinvention. After the neoliberal revolution, the natural thing would have been to undo everything their predecessors did. But instead, left parties became neoliberals too. Why is that? You see, in 1973, neoliberalism was still described as a conservative counterattack against mainstream economics. But since then, a shit ton of think tanks essentially bought neoliberalism its way into academia. And today, the most popular economic textbook is written by a Republican. Economics was essentially bought to turn right-wing, and left parties now suddenly had a foreign body in them. Sure, left factions inside the parties initially resisted this. They could have pulled a 19th century Marxist and simply stopped listening to their advisors. But these left factions had lost most power when unions broke with the parties. The remaining factions inside left parties were the right-wing ones. Factions like the DLC or the Siamer Kreis. They now built ivory towers inside the party, adding superdelegates to the nomination or cutting ties with their youth organizations. And these factions now implemented right-wing economists' advice but sold it to their constituencies by slapping a band-aid on it, namely political strategists. These spin doctors help phrase harmful policy to working-class people in a way that they would buy it. Et voilà, we got neoliberalized leftism. And the saddest thing about this is that none of it was necessary. First of all, it wasn't globalization. In fact, these leftists were the ones who produced it. 
and neither was it their constituencies who changed opinion. In the UK and the US, people to the left of neoliberalized leftism simply stopped voting, and support came by eating into the right wing. This swayed the whole narrative decisively to the right, turning it ever more absurd. On the other hand, in Germany and Sweden, there were simply new parties founded, capturing the people left behind. And now fast forward 10 years. After a period of stagnant wages, where people used their houses as piggy banks, the whole thing suddenly came crashing down in 2008. But instead of questioning the whole system, the lid was put back on the pressure cooker, though this time even more fake. And this naturally left a lot of people with a very bitter taste in their mouth. And as always, despots channel this subtle feeling of being cheated of something into hate. Et voila, we hate migrants now. And the people who elect populists voted left-wing just 30 years ago. And it is in this current transition period that left parties should have already reinvented themselves. So far, it hasn't been as bad as the 1930s, and so far, it's only populists. But some of them already turned into dictators, and Democrats might once more fail so hard that Trump might turn into a dictator as well. This is a transition period after all, where everything is possible. But I personally believe that in some way or another, things will change very soon for the better. And it might just work for sinister reasons. You see, there is this guy from the London School of Economics called Michael Kaletsky, who's famous for predicting the first transition after the war, stagflation, 30 years before it happened. But not only did he predict this, he might also have predicted the current transition period. You see, on a side note, he mentioned that supply-side economics, which is largely what we practice today, naturally evolves into negative interest rates and income subsidies. Because you can only cut so much. And funnily enough, in the past 10 years, we had negative interest rates in many countries. Now that Corona hits, our ammunition might be so used up that supply-side economics becomes so extreme, it turns left-wing again, essentially becoming demand-side economics. People like Trump have already handed out money because tax cuts don't work anymore. This is pretty significant, because it means we now have an opening where something like basic income meets no resistance. This right now might be a chance to implement something that lasts, and the revolution might just play out according to their rules. Hear me out. Stock markets are guaranteed to crash soon. You cannot sustain a bull market with 20% unemployment. When this happens, however, money gets anxious and searches for government bonds. In a crisis, the US gets funding for 0% interest, as well as Germany and perhaps soon the European Union. Governments could now use this free money to buy stocks thereby stabilizing rich people's assets. So far, so dystopian. But these stocks could then be bundled in a sovereign wealth fund, and from this fund, we could finance a UBI. Rinse and repeat a couple of times, and if done right, the people will be the largest shareholder. The government could now pressure the market from the inside, pushing up wages and creating a green transition. It's crazy. But capitalism might get so greedy that it turns itself into a planned economy. Of course, you want some checks and balances on this, but something like this, state capitalism, could represent the next system. But implementing anything as revolutionary as this would require significant will to reform. And if some rogue left party dares, please go ahead. Now is the time to win generations. <laughs>